Right, let's edit some state and in the process power up our usage of property wrappers. If you haven't seen the first two episodes, I do recommend going back and watching them because we're going to be building on the concepts that we learned there. So if you don't know what projected values are or wrap values, then don't worry, this episode will be waiting for you right here when you get back. Now, in the last episode, we were indeed editing state, although it wasn't really that explicit and didn't highlight the issue I wanted to address today. The example we're using today is somewhat more involved. I'll go over it quickly and link the source in the description if you want to have a rummage through it in detail. In this example, we're using some application state in the form of an observable object that is holding an array of users. The structure of these users is very simple, as you can see, and I'm creating my app state in the main view there on line 28 using the state object property wrapper, which is the one you should be using when creating your app state within a view like this. I'm not going to go into the details of that here, since there are many excellent tutorials out there that cover them, and I don't want to get sidetracked. What I will say is that I could have done this. And everything we do going forward will work exactly the same. I wanted to use state object, however, because I thought you'd find it interesting that the projected value of the state object's property wrapper is also a binding, just like the state property wrapper. Let's just undo that and resume. Looking at the definition of state object, we can see why this is the case. Okay, it might not be immediately obvious, so let me help by putting up the definition of observed object, paying particular attention to wrapper there. As you can see, it returns a binding, resolved by the key path of the object it contains, so you can start to see how tightly related all these state property wrappers actually are. So now that we know that the projected value of state object is a binding, we can use it just like we would the state property wrapper by passing this projection into the edit user view. This is then assigned to the binding on line 46 and happy days, we can edit our user. Based on what you're seeing, I probably don't have to tell you that this is certainly not a masterclass in UX. It allows me to demonstrate what I'm talking about though, so it'll have to do. And here we can see the implementation of the edit user view where I'm using a text field bound to the username and I'm incrementing and decrementing the age when pressing on the chevrons. Finally, I'm dismissing the edit screen when the user clicks on the cancel or OK buttons. You can also go back using the default navigation at the top there. Again, as I said, not great UX, but we finally arrived at the problem. Let's say I make a change I'm not happy with. Let's make Molly's last name Nelson. Let's just go back and I'm going to click the cancel button. The change in our edit screen is reflected in our array of users. And this is happening, of course, because just like our counter in the last couple of episodes, the binding to the user pushes our changes to the state that's backing it. And this can be quite a problem to overcome. The reason this can be a challenge is because in order for our edit screen to be responsive when we change values, we are compelled to be using a state property wrapper, or in this case, a state object but ultimately the effect is the same. Now that change can be via a binding or by directly modifying the state, but this leaves us in a bit of a quandary. Bindings are supposed to be used to pass state to child views and state is supposed to be private, solely owned by the view in which it is declared. I've seen rather elaborate solutions to this problem involving data transfer objects and I've explored some of these myself in order to solve what should be a simple problem. Fortunately, based on the knowledge we've learned in the last two episodes, we're in a great position to explore an incredibly simple approach. You see, what we need is some state that is local to the edit view, but is initialized with an external value. Let's see what that looks like. And we're going to change binding to be state. And then we're going to add an initializer that takes in a plain old user. Now, the temptation at this point might be just to write self user equals user. And then, of course, I need to pass in a raw user there. Uh, now, if I try to build this, this will complain. And this is because if you remember from episode one, we were talking about the wrapped value and how if you assign a value to a property wrapper in line, it will use the constructor that takes the wrapped value. Here, we're not providing one and state doesn't have a default initializer, so it can't really initialize that state property wrapper. So it's saying it hasn't been initialized and we're trying to use it. 
It's not a very clear error message here, and I'm sure that will improve in future, but we clearly can't do it this way. You might also think that you could initialize state with a default user, perhaps. Like this, you might say equals, and we'll just put in a default user with a name of temp and an age of zero, and then think, okay, well, now we can use it and everything should compile, right? All looks good. So if we resume that, then what's going to happen? I click here and it says temp, right? So clearly this is not an approach we can use. There's something going on here, which means once the property wrapper has been set up on line 46, we can't then change the value in the initializer. So instead of this default user here, I'm going to use the underscore variant of the variable user, which is the property wrapper. And if you remember, that gives us access to the property wrapper itself. So I can assign that property wrapper by initializing the state itself. We do that like this underscore user equals state with an initial value of the user. So we're taking the raw value that we're passing it up here, assigning it to the initial value of state, and then that can act as our local state for our edit user. So let's resume. And then we click on Molly, we change the name to Nelson, we click cancel, and everything is fixed. But of course, I am pulling your leg. We do, however, have an updating view. We've got the correct initial values in there, and whatever changes I make are reflected in the user interface. Hello. But of course, when I go back to our original view, those changes are not reflected there. We've got to take a proactive step in order to make those changes permanent. And this is the great thing about this approach. It's going to force us to work in a functional way. What we had before was something that could be referred to as side effect coding. We're making changes in our view, but it is actually affecting something over there, something that we don't actually want to update until we are happy with the result. Instead of canceling something and having to revert, we're going to take the alternative approach of only making changes when we click the OK button. And the way we do that is very simple indeed. All we need to do is pass in a callback that's going to handle the saving when we want to say OK. So we're going to make that the last parameter in our initializer so we can use it as a trailing closure at the call site. So we say save handler, which is going to be escaping, takes a user and returns nothing. And we're going to need a place for it, which is going to be save handler with the same signature. And then we can set it. And then at the call site, we can add a trailing closure to this. User in, and we say the app state users. We can utilize the fact that we're on this specific index and then replace that particular user with the one that we've got from our edit view. The last thing we need to do is to actually call that save handler when the user presses OK. Here we are in the action button that is responsible for saying OK. And then before we dismiss, I'm going to say save handler and pass in the user that we've just been modifying. User. Then I can resume. And if we've done everything correctly, when I click on Molly, and I can change it to Ringwald, and then say OK, and we get the update that we desire. And I really do love the fact that we are proactively saying, I now want to save this change, as opposed to working behind the scenes to revert any changes that we don't like. And that's all there is to it for this episode. But don't worry, we've got a couple more episodes in this one where we're going to be exploring validation and how we can move that validation into property wrappers so we can learn about how to create our own property wrappers and encapsulate functionality that would otherwise be cluttering up our code. And in the next episode, we're going to be looking at the age validation. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you're enjoying this series, let me know by hitting the like button. And if you want to see more of this kind of thing, but you're not subscribed, make sure you do that. And there's a lot less chance that you'll miss it because there's some great stuff on its way, even if I do say so myself. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.